I'm Chris Hansen. Right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. A holiday weekend ends with a young mother shot dead. You took something from me that is like my backbone, my heart and soul, my best friend. Her husband admits he fired the gun. I shot that straight up in the air. But the ex-Marine says she was hit by accident. If he is the experienced marksman, he should know how to handle a firearm in a responsible manner. Now, after a controversial trial, prosecutors trying to prove he murdered his wife. Did he get away with murder? This will haunt me for the rest of my life. Today, he's on the hot seat with our Narissa Knight for his first TV interview. You were outraged. Yes. You were very heated. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't that how murders take place? Then she was one of nine children who suddenly didn't show up for her weekly family dinner. Well, I knew within a few days this was more than just a missing person case. Was she being stalked by this woman? She had a knife, and she tell her she's going to kill her. Right now. Go. Let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. We start today with a Crime Watch Daily exclusive new interview. For the very first time, the man at the center of a controversial shooting death in Virginia is breaking his silence about what he says really happened inside his home. Here's Narissa Knight with today's top story, Shots in the Basement. Chris, it all starts with a Virginia man rushing into a firehouse with a desperate request. His wife is dying and he needs help, but it's how she got that injury that will take investigators down a long and windy road. Even though she was the youngest of her siblings, Katrina Banks was the matriarch of her family. She was our backbone of our family. The one who kept everyone in line. She always made sure we had the right education. We paid our bills. We was all in order. And the glue that kept everyone together. She just made us come together, even if we lived far away. Any kind of special occasion, family reunions, birthdays. The last family gathering Katrina planned was a big birthday bash. We always celebrate our birthday together because her birthday is a week before mine. It was the weekend before Thanksgiving 2016. Katrina got everyone to Baltimore for three days of fun. We celebrated had a birthday cookout with the family. All the family showed up. Even her big sister, Diane. And technically, I wasn't even supposed to be there. <laughs> I'm not a big communicator. I don't like to socialize. But it wasn't easy to say no to Katrina. She was my best friend. She was like my heart and soul. By Sunday afternoon, it was time for everyone to say their goodbyes. I just told her how much I loved her more than life. And with that, Katrina and her two kids headed back to Virginia. Her husband, Alvin, who had driven up separately, wouldn't be far behind. What was that marriage like? It was just so much love, so much togetherness. And he was so attentive to her. I mean, it was just loving family. Alvin, a former Marine, was a very successful RV salesman in Richmond. Katrina, a nurse who had just earned her master's degree. The couple had a young son and daughter, and to everyone who knew them seemed like a perfect couple. When I saw them together, I can say they looked like they were loving. Um, I would have never guessed um, anything different. Until that Sunday night when the image of their picture-perfect marriage was shattered by gunfire. At the hospital, Alvin tells detectives he mistakenly shot his wife during a heated argument sparked by jealousy. Hey, why the f call her seven times? Alvin says he just returned from Baltimore and was preparing dinner when Katrina starts questioning him about phone calls he made to her cousin, Roxanne. I'm like, what are you, where, where are you going with this? Katrina's cousin had spent the night with the couple at their Baltimore hotel that weekend. After checking out, Alvin claims Roxanne asked him about a missing pair of earrings. He said, no, you called her seven times. I'm like, Trina. I said, was driving back, we lost connection. She called me back, I called her back, and she kept pushing. And I was like, I said, leave it alone. I said, there's nothing going on. So basically this whole thing stemmed from her thinking you're messing around on her. Oh my God, it's, it's crazy, dude. Roxanne, um, 
All the women in the family are threatened by her. You know, I mean, she's a beautiful woman. Alvin insists he wasn't messing around with Roxanne and says when he couldn't convince Katrina, the fight got physical. So I picked up a, a TV tray. I threw it downstairs, making sure I didn't hit her. Bam! I was like, stop. You're pissing me off. When the yelling continued, he grabbed his gun. So I figured if I grabbed my 45 and shot a couple rounds off in the air, then that will make her shut the gunshots did more than just shut Katrina up. One of five bullets fired struck her in the shoulder. Rather than call 911, Alvin ran to a nearby fire station for help. I said, dude, I shot my wife. I shot my wife. So he comes out and he's like, what? I said, I shot my wife. I said, let's go, let's go. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. But rescuers arrived too late to save Katrina. Detectives break the devastating news during their interrogation. Your wife has passed. I'm not going to not tell you, man. It wouldn't be right, OK? How? That's what we're here to find out. A single bullet had entered Katrina's shoulder, traveled through her lungs and spine before exiting her body. Did you ever in your wildest dreams think that something like this would happen? No, I would never especially less than 24 hours after seeing her, no. Diane had just gotten into bed when detectives called with the tragic news. They told me my sister was gone, and all I could think about, no, she's not, because I had just talked to her. She says Katrina had texted her a little earlier to say she'd made it home safely. And I hung the phone up, because I thought I was dreaming. The detective called, and he said, don't hang up. It's not a dream. This is real. Your sister's gone. Up next, Alvin admits firing his gun in anger. But the ex-Marine insists he didn't mean to kill his wife. We did not believe this to be an accident. We return with more of today's story, Shots in the Basement. Once again, here's reporter Narissa Knight in Virginia. Chris, Katrina Banks is dead, shot in the basement of her home while her two children slept. There's no question her husband pulled the trigger, but there is a question of, was it on purpose? Shortly after Katrina Banks was shot dead by her husband, he admits to cops he pulled the trigger during a heated argument. So I went bop, bop, bop. I think it was three. And I noticed it got, it got quiet. Ironically, just days before the tragic event, Alvin was photographed with the gun holstered around his shoulder and a t-shirt reading, keep calm. As he's grilled by cops at the hospital, Alvin Banks is anything but calm, insisting the killing was an accident, claiming the bullet that ended Katrina's life was only intended to end their argument. Could you see her when you were shooting the rounds? Could you? Yeah, I was looking at her. I was shooting that straight up because it was just a, a getaway stop thing. Investigators weren't buying it. Alvin's hot-headed moment would soon carry serious consequences. Mr. Banks was arrested the night of the incident and charged with second degree murder. And after a close look at the evidence, we were able to elevate the charge from second degree to first degree. Alvin Banks was also charged with using a firearm to commit a felony, unlawful discharge of a firearm inside a home, and two counts of child endangerment. What were the endangerment charges based on? The idea that these children were in the home uh, in close proximity to their mother at the time that she was killed. Charges his own lawyers knew would be a challenge to fight. One of those bullets went through the wall, down into the basement, and lodged in the wall inches above baby's head. But as for the charge of first degree murder. A plea deal from the beginning with this case was out of the question for you and your client. Exactly. And we told them there will be no plea to a murder charge. None. Don't even bring it to us. You were standing strong. We, we, we had a strong case. You believed your client? Did wholeheartedly. Yeah. The prosecution was just as confident. How did the charge of second degree murder get elevated to first degree murder and why? The difference between a first degree murder and a second degree murder is the premeditation and the 
the a forethought before pulling the trigger. Our theory was that not only was this firearm brought in to perhaps threaten and stop the argument, but actually to stop Katrina and kill her. Alvin Banks was held without bail for nearly a year until his trial got underway. When we were picking the jury, we asked them, just because my client fired the gun in the house and a bullet ultimately killed wife, you know, are you automatically already going to convict them? And we tried to select a jury that would be open-minded to this. During opening statements, defense attorney Joe Morrissey told jurors why Alvin Banks was not guilty of first-degree murder. Number one, you've got to shoot and tend to kill. Number two, you've got to do it with malice. That means a, a bad heart, mean-spirited way. And just because you shoot in the house, which shows anger, which shows frustration, doesn't equate with malice. Shannon Taylor is the Commonwealth's attorney for Henrico County. The idea of anyone bringing a firearm into an argument to suggest that some action is accidental is simply just not logical. <laughs> The case largely came down to flying bullets and their trajectories. Both sides agreed that three of the five bullets fired by Alvin were shot into the ceiling. The defense argued the other two were fired into the floor. One we know did because it went down in the basement. That bullet lodged into the wall just above the couple's two-year-old daughter who was asleep in her bed. The question then became, where's the fifth bullet? Prosecutors argued it was fired straight into the door leading downstairs, going directly through Katrina Banks' shoulder. But defense attorney James Maloney told jurors the evidence proves otherwise. There were a few points of the forensics that I thought were particularly important, just as their evidence laid out. Such as? Well, first of all, the bullet itself that everyone agreed was the fatal shot had a dent in it. He argued that dent was proof the bullet had ricocheted off of something. Maloney says in court, the prosecution's own expert agreed. Second, there was a hole in the door. Not just a hole, though, it was elongated. Their own expert agreed that that type of hole could very well be caused by a tumbling bullet rather than one that was traveling straight on. And third, the bullet wound in Katrina's shoulder. Another one of their experts, the medical examiner, by looking at the uh, shape of the entry wound, she conceded that it was a reasonable possibility that that bullet, rather than passing straight through, was passing through because it was tumbling. Alvin's lawyers were so confident the evidence would clear their client, they didn't even put him on the stand. There's nothing that he could add to the case. We said, why do we put him on? They already had his statement. Instead, the 18-minute interrogation by Enrico police detectives was played for the jury. I shot that straight up in the air. I don't know, it must have hit something and ricocheted down. Prosecutors pointing out Alvin's extensive weapons training as an ex-Marine as proof he intended to kill his wife that night. If he is the experienced marksman that he is asserting himself to be, he should know how to handle a firearm in a responsible manner. And firing it into the house? Is absolutely irresponsible. Irresponsible, yes, but does it rise to the level of first degree murder? In the end, those 12 jurors said no in a big way. Finding him not guilty of murder even refusing to convict on a possible lesser charge. The jury could have given the lightest offense manslaughter, and they chose not to even do that. For Katrina's family, it was a devastating blow. What went through your mind when you heard the verdict acquitted Alvin Banks? After I heard the first one, I was already gone. You were out of there. I was gone. How did you get him off? My partner and I felt from the very beginning that if we could show the jury that there was anger involved, but the anger wasn't directed towards, I am going to kill wife, but rather, I'm gonna do something dumb, like fire a gun inside the house, that they would be opened to 
our theory of what happened. The jury did find Alvin Banks guilty on the two child endangerment counts and unlawful discharge of a firearm inside a home. In January, he was sentenced to 16 months behind bars, then released the next day because of time served. And now Alvin Banks is speaking with Crime Watch Daily in his first TV interview. You know there's a risk with speaking out, with talking. Absolutely. Up next. You told detectives that you wanted to choke Katrina. Right. You were outraged. Yes. You were very heated. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't that how murders take place? Many people feel Alvin Banks should be in prison right now and for a long time. But instead, the Virginia husband is a free man. And today, in his first ever national TV interview, he's talking to our Nerissa Knight about the night his wife Katrina was killed. Nearly a year after Alvin Banks fired the shot that killed his wife Katrina, a Virginia jury found him not guilty of first degree murder. It's not a victory. It's not a uh, reward because the bottom line is my wife isn't here anymore. Just weeks after being released from prison, he's telling his story exclusively to Crime Watch Daily. And why are you speaking out? Because um, after talking to a few of my friends, they, they have no idea what really happened. Um, and something as sensitive as this is, I wanted uh, everyone to know exactly what happened. The former Marine appearing far more muted in our interview than he did during his interrogation. At no point in my military mind would I ever point my weapon at my wife. I love her. Y'all hear me? I believe. I love her. Have, Have you, you ever, ever done that before? Hell no. Uh, okay. Hell no. Alvin says the tragic and deadly shooting occurred during the biggest fight he'd ever had with his wife. She was furious. I mean, I had never seen her as mad before. According to prosecutors, you went off on a profanity ranting raid. Right. Is this true? Yes. You were outraged. Yes. You were very heated. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't that how murders take place? People get upset, they get mad, they shoot somebody, they take them out? Were you that mad? No, that never entered my mind. According to Alvin, the argument started when Katrina noticed he'd repeatedly called her cousin, Roxanne. I said, Trina, calm down. I said, this was not that serious. She was looking for her earrings and she called you first, but um, your phone was dead. Alvin claims Katrina became completely unhinged when she saw the selfie he sent Roxanne. And I'm like, you mean a picture of me and your brother at Buffalo Wild Wings holding a couple beers up? I said, yeah, what's wrong with that? Alvin says the jealousy-filled fight quickly escalated. Katrina grabbed his phone and headed downstairs. So I followed behind her. As I turned to go down the steps, I saw my 45, and I just grabbed it. I shut off rounds. With your training especially, people will ask, why did you pick up a firearm? during an argument and fire it several times. Rage, just angry. I wanted her to stop, you know, and I figured, you know, popping off a few rounds, she would hear that and be like, whoa, that, that's, we're gonna end this conversation. I just knew that those rounds would, you know, go through the ceiling and, and uh, settle in the floor. But one of the bullets ricocheted down into the basement, striking Katrina in the shoulder. I went downstairs and I saw her laying there. And I said, girl, get up, stop playing. I thought she was joking. Katrina wasn't playing. As I got closer down to her, I saw something shining on her shoulder. And I reached down and touched it. And I brought my hand up and it was blood. And I was like, oh my God. The bitter fight was definitely over. Alvin had killed his wife, the mother of his two youngest children. When you heard your wife was dead, what went through your mind? First thing I thought were my children. If it wasn't for my children, I would, I would take my own life, without a doubt. But I have to be here for them. Alvin would soon face five felony charges, including first degree murder. What did you think when those charges were filed against you? I thought they were absolutely ridiculous. I just, I could not believe it. Uh, involuntary manslaughter? all day long. My wife is gone, and it was my actions that caused that. 
Alvin says had he been charged with involuntary manslaughter, he would have pleaded guilty and would likely still be behind bars. The defense contends that you overreached with going for the murder one charge. We believed that Mr. Banks' conduct was willful and premeditated, and because of the nature of the argument that he wanted to inflict harm upon her. Alvin did tell detectives the night of the killing he felt like choking his wife. This is supposed to sound I should have just grabbed her because I wanted to grab her. That's how I feel like choking you right now. That sounds like you wanted to harm her. When the detectives told me um, that, uh, that she passed away, in my mind I was thinking I should have just choked her, um, which would have been a difference between an argument, possible incarceration, but my wife would be alive. Alvin was convicted for endangering the lives of his two kids and for firing a gun inside a home. The day after the sentencing, he was released after serving a little more than 14 months behind bars. Not nearly enough for Katrina's heartbroken family. Did Alvin Banks get away with killing his wife, your sister? From me, from my perspective, I believe so. How do you feel knowing that Alvin Banks is walking around free. I don't think that the, you would want those words on camera. But Alvin feels his wife's death is a life sentence. I'm only a shell of the man that I was because my wife is gone. Um, the better half of me is gone. This will haunt me for the rest of my life. Um, this, is, this is torture. It's also been torture for Katrina's mother, who lost her son to heart disease a year before Katrina passed. What do you want to say to Katrina's family? It was an honest mistake. It was an accident. Katrina meant the world to me. They know that. Alice Cromwell says Alvin never apologized directly to her, and she can't accept his explanation. With a weapon, there is no accident, because you may have a choice. Despite the child endangerment convictions, Alvin is again living with his two kids, something Katrina's sister Diane didn't know until we told her. This is the first I'm hearing of this, so um, I knew he had visited kids uh, and it was monitored, uh, but I did not know that part. <laughs> I'm sorry you didn't know. I'm okay. It's okay. Is that salt to your wounds that he is in the home with the children? <laughs> oh, it's not even a salt. It's like, um, if I can say it, it's just like I've been stabbed all over again and it's been taken away. You have your kids. They're with you. But you were convicted of endangering their life. This was an isolated incident. If it was an unsafe environment from past uh, actions, absolutely. If I had a history of anger, you know, temper tantrums or breaking things, shooting guns, anything. You now have a history of killing their mother. Right, but not one point in my time did I think that I would ever harm my children. Diane says Alvin also never thought he'd hurt his wife. Where do you think the children should be? No matter where these children are, he should not be living under the same roof with these kids. He was charged with a crime of their life. People would say that you don't deserve the kids. The weapons, I don't have any weapons in my home now. That's because as a convicted felon, Alvin isn't allowed to own a gun. However, his hope is to change that. The ex-Marine is planning to appeal his convictions. If I do ever get my privileges back, they'll all be under lock and key. It just won't, it just won't happen. You know, um, my children mean the world to me. It was a bad decision. A bad split-second decision that's left his two children without their mother and left Katrina's heartbroken mother waiting to personally hear one thing. He never come to me and, and express to me what happened. Never said, I made a mistake, I messed up, I'm sorry. Why you can't come to me and say those words and mean those words? I haven't heard anything. A complicated criminal case for sure, so we brought in criminal defense attorney Sarah Azari to help us understand how this all works. Thanks for being here, I appreciate it very much. Let's start with your opinion on why prosecutors would stick with first-degree murder as opposed to taking a plea of manslaughter. Is that overreaching? 
It's overzealous for sure, and I think that they overestimated the evidence in this case. There's no evidence of motive. There really is no evidence of premeditation. The prosecutors essentially had argued that when Banks went to get the gun and came back and shot around, that there was this opportunity to plan the shooting, and that's premeditation. They're wrong because this occurred amidst this heated argument, so really the proper charge would have been manslaughter. Do you think Katrina's family has a good civil case here, and what hurdles do they face? I don't think there are any hurdles here, Chris. I think they have a case for wrongful death in which they have to prove that there was a duty of care, which Banks had. He had to keep the safe home as a person that was living there, that he breached that duty by grabbing these guns and shooting around randomly. He's definitely breached that duty and that there was causation because of that breach of duty that this death occurred. I mean, but for him shooting around, this bullet would not have ricocheted and landed on Katrina. So I think they have a really good case in terms of liability. Here's a question. He was found guilty on the child in endangerment charges, so it begs the question, how is he living with the kids again already? When you're deciding on, as a court of law, on the custody of children, it's about what is in their best interest. And I think when you look at the history of this man, he's a military guy, he's a good father, this was an accident, it was not a murder, that's why he got the child endangerment conviction. Um, ultimately, he's not going to be around guns, the home is going to be safe, because he's a felon, he can't possess guns. He is going to have to go to extensive parenting classes. So at the end of the day, he may still be the most suitable person to care for these children. Sarah, as always, thank you very much for weighing in on this case. And for more on this story, you can go to CrimeWatchDaily.com. Still to come, a school shooting plot foiled by an unlikely hero. It only took one grandmother to maybe save a whole bunch of lives. Crime Watch Daily with one teen's disturbing detailed blueprint for murder that made his grandma jump into action. Next. Now to Washington State, where police believe they may have avoided another mass school shooting thanks to the help of a grandmother and her watchful eye. We're teaming up with our Seattle affiliate Q13 Fox News for the very latest. President Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un in hoodies, a coin flip, and chilling entries in a journal. Evidence cops say that could have led to a school shooting massacre until the boy's brave grandmother thwarts the alleged plot. 911, what is the location of your emergency? What I'm reporting is I'm finding um, journal entries from my grandson. Crime Watch Daily has obtained the shocking 911 call. The grandmother is turning in her own grandson after she claims she found those disturbing entries in his journal. He's planning to um, have a mass shooting at one of the high schools. His name is Joshua Alexander O'Connor, an 18-year-old high school student from Everett, Washington, about 30 miles north of Seattle. It only took one grandmother to maybe save a whole bunch of lives. After Grandma's call to 911, O'Connor was pulled out of class and arrested at school. That would have probably been one of the hardest calls she probably has ever made. Um, but I think that the content of the journal and some of the other evidence that was in the house was enough that she was alarmed enough. The arrest coming just one day before the deadly mass shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, where 17 people died. Everett police say the evidence included a semi-automatic rifle the grandmother told them she found in his guitar case and in O'Connor's own written words, a promise to use it. The defendant himself in his writings uh, refers to as the same type of rifle that Eric Harris, the Columbine shooter, used in his crimes. Court documents reveal what cops call a step-by-step -step plan titled Outline for Aces Massacre. Aces is the name of O'Connor's school. He allegedly writes, I'm learning from past shooters, bombers' mistakes, so I don't make the same ones. I need to get the biggest fatality number I possibly can. Smoke kids down in hallway and gym. Can't wait to walk into that class and blow all those expletives away. The defendant presents a substantial danger. Cops say O'Connor planned the shooting for April 19th, the anniversary of the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. The next day, April 20th, is the anniversary of the Columbine school shooting in Colorado. And it's been widely reported that O'Connor, even once dressed up, 
as Columbine shooter Eric Harris as an assignment for acting class. This was a student that uh, nobody would have suspected. Police say O'Connor couldn't decide in which school to launch his deadly attack. His old school or his current one, Ace's Alternative High School. So he flipped a coin. The court documents called it the coin flip of fate, and Ace's won the flip. Fellow student Colton Luquette tells our Seattle affiliate KCPQ the alleged plot was never on his radar. We would just sit in third period together and just listen to music. Colton's mom, Crystal, is understandably freaked out. My heart goes out to that woman, and I'm grateful to her because she saved all those kids' lives. Cops say during a search of the house O'Connor shared with his grandmother, they found two inert grenades and plans to fill them with black powder to make them explosive again. And they say O'Connor also planned to use pressure cooker bombs at the school. Bombs that are similar to the ones used at the deadly Boston Marathon attack back in 2013. Cops say during the search, they also found evidence linking him to the armed robbery of a convenience store a day earlier. Take a look at this just released surveillance video. Cops say that's O'Connor in a Kim Jong-un mask holding a rifle. His alleged accomplice, a classmate named Marquez Daniel. Detectives say Daniel is wearing a Donald Trump mask and grabbing the cash. The prosecutor says the purpose of the alleged robbery was to get money to buy more guns and ammo. I would also argue that the robbery itself is a substantial step uh, in an effort to raise funds. O'Connor has been charged with attempted first degree murder with a firearm, first degree robbery, and possession of a bomb or explosive device with intent to use for unlawful purpose. He pleaded not guilty. There is no ammunition, there is nothing else to suggest other than the defendant's statements in his journal. The judge set bail at $5 million. She saved countless lives here, if not even her grandsons. I mean, who would have known what would have happened to him if he actually carried it out? It's still unclear if Marquez Daniel, the other teen arrested and charged with the AMPM robbery, knew about O'Connor's alleged school shooting plot. He's pleaded not guilty and is hoping to post bond and return to school so he can graduate this June. Up next, a young woman missing, a mother searching for answers. I hope one day she could come back home. Crime Watch Daily inside the puzzling case and why cops are turning up the heat on an obsessed ex. She was hers. She'll do anything to keep her. Coming up. Our next story takes us to Atlanta. That's where a young woman on the right path in life appears to have fallen for the wrong person. Now police are trying to determine if that ill-fated relationship cost her her life. A young woman leaves for work as usual, but never clocks in. It's just like she dropped off the face of the earth. And police soon realize this is no ordinary missing persons case. This one was a little different. Because they say Shondell McLeod has been stalked by an obsessed former lover right up until the day she disappeared. Shondell was afraid. And she said, Mommy, I never begged so much for my life. 35-year-old Shondell was the special sixth of Boticia McLeod's nine children. She was loved by her brothers. And the creative one. She had loved to dance and sing. Shondell also loved to cook and turned it into a good-paying career working as the head chef at an Atlanta nursing home. She had bought a house, then bought a, a new car. A car that would disappear along with Shondell when she left her home to drive to work early one Sunday morning. Soon as I hear she didn't show up to work, I know something wrong. Shondell's mother becomes even more concerned when her daughter also fails to turn up later at the family's weekly Sunday night dinner. I did not sleep that night. No one else who knew Shondell had seen her or heard from her either. And after she's reported missing, police would learn Shondell hadn't used any debit or credit cards, nor made any text or calls. Her phone wasn't even pinging. I even pinged her phone. 
And everything points to foul play when that phone isn't in Shondell's car, which had been found abandoned about 40 miles from her home. Well, I knew within a few days this was more than just a missing person case. DeKalb County PD Detective H. Guest theorizes Shondell was snatched as she left her house. It was somebody that abducted her right there. And it's not long before detectives have a person of interest. That would be Joyce. Joyce Pelzer, a fellow nursing home employee they said had a frightening obsession with Shondell. Well, I interviewed a lot of people. Between three or four of them told me that Shondell was very afraid of this lady. Detective Guest says Joyce had reportedly fallen in love with Shondell at first sight. And Shondell would enter in what's believed to have been her first romantic relationship with a woman. She said she wanted to try a gay lifestyle. Joyce would eventually move into Shondell's home. It was going good for a few years. But Shondell's mom says her daughter had grown unhappy. She said, Mommy, I wanted to have children. Joyce is said to have been furious when Shondell told her she wanted to break up. She didn't take it nice. She didn't want to give her up. And Joyce is said to have told friends she wouldn't let Shondell go without a fight. She was hers. She'll do anything to keep her. It would culminate with Joyce allegedly threatening to end both their lives in a murder-suicide. Shondell tell me that Joy tell her she's gonna kill her. Police say Joyce had fled before they arrived at the scene, but warrants were issued for her arrest for allegedly assaulting Shondell. This is a few weeks before she went missing. And police say Joyce continued to stalk Shondell, even staking out her home late at night. She used to sit outside and watch the house. Detective Guest says Shondell had a new boyfriend who was spending nights at her house for protection. And she was so afraid the guy bought her a gun. And when Shondell suddenly goes missing, Joyce is among the first brought in for questioning. She denied everything. Detectives, however, would arrest Joyce on that outstanding assault warrant and also charge her with lying to them about her alibi for the day Shondell vanished. Since so she said she was at work and she wasn't. But now, almost seven years since Shondell disappeared, police still haven't found enough evidence to prove or disprove that Joyce Pelzer had any role, and her status in the case remains unchanged. I'm not going to leave out the other people, but Miss Pelzer is my main person. The person who Detective Guest believes holds the answer to what happened to Shondell. I don't think Shondell is alive. I think Shondell was murdered. And if she was, he's confident her killer will ultimately trip up. I don't believe in the perfect murder. But while the search for Shondell continues, no news is good news to her desperate, grieving mother. I hope one day she could come back home. We reached out to Joyce Pelzer for comment on our story, but she never responded. Now it's time for someone to step forward and clear their conscience. If you know anything about Sean Del McLeod's disappearance, call Crime Stoppers of Atlanta at 1-404-577-8477. Let's prove to this suspect that we are watching. Coming up, a beautiful young woman captured on surveillance video and is never seen again. What really happened to Christina Morris? Crime Watch Daily with a major development out of Texas. Next. We're back now with these haunting images. A young Texas girl walks with a friend. The grainy video the last time Christina Morris would ever be seen again. Today, we have a big development on the story that haunted the Dallas suburb of Plano for years. A major break in the disappearance of Christina Morris, a mystery that's haunted her heartbroken family for years. These are the last images of Christina captured on this grainy surveillance video. You can see Christina and Enrique Orochi walking near a shopping mall parking lot in Plano, Texas. The two knew each other from high school and ran into one another that night at a party. Orochi tells police he walked Christina to the parking garage and never saw her again. I wish I walked her to her car so none of this would have happened. But shortly after Christina went missing, police recovered her DNA in the trunk of Orochi's car. Still, the 26-year-old insisted he was innocent. I had nothing to do with the disappearance of Christina Morris. I don't know anything about the disappearance of Christina Morris. I'm more than happy to keep cooperating with them so we can find Christina. Despite his repeated claims of innocence, 
Orochi was charged with kidnapping Christina Morris. A jury convicted him and sentenced Orochi to life in prison. Christina's mom was noticeably relieved walking out of the courtroom, but the verdict is still bittersweet for her family. I feel like the right thing happened. It's far from over. Christina's still missing. That was nearly two years ago. Now the ultimate heartbreak. The Collin County Medical Examiner's Office has examined the recovered remains and this morning has positively identified the remains as those of Christina Morris. Christina's skeletal remains were found in a remote wooded area near Anna, Texas, about 30 miles away from where she was last seen in Plano. Christina's mom was inconsolable. I just, I just want everybody to know, please respect our privacy. We need to heal. Part of the healing process for Christina's mother was to go back to lay flowers where her beautiful daughter's body was found. She also lashed out on Facebook, Enrique, you will rot in hell. Now that Christina has been found, one of the questions prosecutors have to answer is, will Enrique Orochi also be charged with her murder? Orochi is now eligible for parole in 2044. If he's tried and convicted of murder, the chances of him ever getting out of prison would be erased.